Hey man, appreciate all you guys. Pretty decent crowd. I'm sure we'll get some more. We always, nobody's ever here on time with this thing. They, they've just been hanging out with me too long. They know it's usually going to be late. But I've been on a streak of being on time lately, so now they're late, right? So, but tonight we're going to have our free seminar series from Lake Fork Marina, just talking about Lake Fork bass fishing, what's going on this time of year, current situation type deal. And specifically tonight, we're going to talk to you guys about, I'm going to talk to you guys about fishing docks and fishing grass flats, but not just that. We're gonna go into the spot within the spot and how you guys can just look at a map on any lake and pick out the best docks and the best sections of grass in big areas, big long main lake stretches, big long creek arms of grass. We're gonna dial in how you guys can find the juice within those big massive areas. It can, sometimes you pull to a lake, it's got a thousand docks, it's overwhelming, where do you start, right? So we're gonna try and help you with that and really specifically, how to do it right now this time of year. The type of docks are gonna be good for this time of year. That way, for those guys that are coming out next week for Berkeley, it'll help y'all. For those of y'all that are in attendance that might be fishing whatever tournaments out here this weekend, because there's always some. I know we got the Bass Cat Owners Tournament. Is anybody fishing Bass Cat Owners Tournament? No, nobody in the room? Well, they're all missing out. They should be coming up here listening to this, because I think we got some good stuff as far as something where you can just take a look at Navionics, take a look at Google Earth, and you'll be able to just go, right there and i bet you you're gonna pull up and find that it's right there because it's it's pretty consistent this time of year when they're transitioning and spread out a bunch which areas are going to tend to gather fish even though there's really no gathering of fish so to speak when they're transitioning but these areas are going to have more than anywhere else you'll find so we're going to do that and then afterwards when i get done with that cody is going because cody's big time tournament angler out here was for for a couple years there and now he started guiding but he's going to discuss if he was fishing the berkeley tournament coming up or the basket owners tomorrow what he'd be doing and how he would how he would attack it what baits he would use what tactics he would deploy so if y'all have questions at any time just shout them out holler whatever y'all want to do it's a real informal deal Except for you. <laughs> Got to make sure my oldest son, he, he, hey, that's our girl. He'll be talking about everything. He's like his dad. He can talk now. So one thing that I'm doing right now is I'm fishing a lot of docks. I'm fishing docks first thing in the morning, and I don't want to give too much away because we're really going to go into that in depth on Monday's video. Uh, I'm fishing. There's a type of docks that I'm fishing first thing in the morning. And there's type of docks that I'm fishing throughout the day and especially late in the day, like 11 noon to three, four, you know, whenever my guide trips are done and whenever your tournaments will be finishing up. Uh, two totally different dynamics. For the morning one, I'm gonna let you watch Monday's video. I'll just, have to, I'll just say this, it has to do with lights. It doesn't have to do with what I'm about to talk to you about. But the all day long docks, the docks that are gonna be best throughout the day, we're gonna talk about that right now. So. I like to fish main lake docks. With what's going on right now, we've been having turnover. It's kind of seems like it's wrapping up. The fish are starting to behave a little bit more like fall every day. It seems like you'll have little windows, little spurts of fish that are grouped up and feed like fall, just in tiny little windows. And then most of the day, it still feels kind of like turnover where they're real spread out. They're transitioning. You get one bite here on this bait, one bite there. Like you might catch eight fish in a day and you need to use six or seven different baits to do it. Like that's the kind of stuff that's been going on out here. But one way where you can consistently find fish every single day, once the sun's high from noon to three, you can find fish every single day on main lake docks. Uh, you know, if the creek arm's big enough, you can consider that main lake. Does, is anybody confused by that? I say main lake, I think sometimes people want to take it by the textbook definition of it's got to be right out here near the main boat lane. Well, when you got creek arms as big as Dale Creek and Birch Creek and Little Mustang, uh, any of the Mustangs, either one, uh, Little Caney, you know, like those docks down towards the mouth of Little Caney that are out there on the main part of Little Caney, not back in the corners of the pocket, those to me are main lake docks, right? So just the big part of the lake, big wide open water, deep water close by, that's gonna be what I consider main lake docks. Now, what you'll find is creek channels are gonna be such a huge deal in this because when fish are transitioning, they're moving, right? Well, when they're moving, their roadway, their highways, their county roads, their map system is the low spots, the creek channels, the drains, ditches, what, you know, the secondary stuff, you call them drains and ditches, whatever you want to call it. But wherever the low spot is, that's where those fish are going to travel. And then they'll get up on flats and feeding areas outside of that. But when they're moving, they tend to travel in those low spots. So creek channel swings are going to be the biggest deal that you can target on main lake docks, right? Because when, whenever this, 
turnover, fall, summer to fall transition starts. What happens is the fish that are grouped up offshore at the end of summer, when the lake starts flipping and you know you get bad water conditions, or just when the days start shortening and fish start to cue in on their instincts and hey, we need to start moving, right? Those schools break up and those fish scatter out along the banks everywhere. And they'll be in this little pocket and they'll be on that patch, patch of grass on the main lake bank and they're liable to be anywhere up shallow kind of spread out. Well, as they travel, we have something what we like to call transition points. Uh, transition points or transition stop signs, what that is is it's a place that as they're spread out and traveling, it tends to gather a few of them. Some of them tend to stop there for a minute. It's why we call them stop signs. It's just a place that's convenient for them to set up a temporary home. Man, that crowd down there is loud. Because I'm, I'm loud and they're overpowering me, so they're real loud. But it, it's just, it's a temporary place for a fish to set up a temporary home. Maybe for a day or two, maybe for a week or two, and maybe for a month. Right now, our turnover process has kind of gotten prolonged because we've had prolonged warmer conditions, right? So it started cooling off and then it just kind of and the water stayed between 80 and 85 for a long time now. And that's still where it is for the most part. Sometimes in the morning it's 79, but for the most part it's between 80 and 85. So creek channel swings are gonna play such a big role in this. And you can see right here that you'll be on the main lake and a creek channel swing right in. Sometimes the creek channel swing almost under the dock. Sometimes it will go under the end of the dock at times. That, that's the best you can get because what you want and what those fish will do is as they're traveling down here they go oh man that's a nice house right there for me to sit on for a day hey look at look at them bait watered up in that brush pile under that dock right there and they'll kind of sit on that dock for a little while right so instead of just having the one-off fish that's passing through that you catch you'll have the one-off fish that's passing through and then he'll stay there for a few days and then next thing you know later that day another one comes in tomorrow three or more come in now you got four or five fish hanging out under this dock for a little while that's a lot better than one here one there on a different bait everywhere you go right it's a big improvement and what will happen is those fish will stay right here and then when they really want to get active and feed you'll see schooling activity here 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 all between them but day in day out especially in the middle of the day when that sun gets highest they're going to home they're going to get up under that shade they're going to ambush anything they can that comes under there during the high sun time of the day but they're going to stay under that dock in that time now one thing you can do in the mornings especially is if you get a good stretch of docks it's got some good creek swings it's got some bait it's got some life first thing in the morning those fish will be outside of the docks just up and down the bank in between them and they'll be busting top water and you can catch them on a little whopper plopper you can catch them on a little walking bait you can catch them just pitching a little old jig around square bill just kind of almost any way you want to really uh and that turns into the one more of the one here one there bite because those fish have now scattered on these high spots and these flats in between these docks. But then at noon to three, you're going to catch them right there. And you're probably going to catch them best on a shaky head and a wacky worm. Or a drop shot if you're a drop shot guy. If you're a drop shot guy, it's a great bait. To me, especially if it's calm or fairly calm, which it won't be this weekend, unfortunately, but next weekend it might be, right, for the Berkeley. The wacky worm's the deal. Later in the day, if it's calm enough to get you a wacky worm and throw it up under that dock because when it's calm especially and really whether it's calm or not a lot of those fish in the heat of the day right now are going to suspend under that darkest heaviest shade in that dock they're going to get to the darkest place of it they're going to suspend up by the surface that's where the coolest water temps are going to be and they're going to find something to sit on right there dock pile and a piece of brush whatever it may be so that's really that wacky worm is the one that catches them the best for me because it falls so slow it'll stay in those suspending fishes face for so long and when you're, when you're dealing with docks that have creek channel swings close to them those docks are going to tend to have more depth on them so you can't throw a shaky head in there and it's three foot of water and yeah he's suspended at one foot but he's two foot from your bait no he might be six eight ten foot away from your bait if you throw something goes to the bottom in there if he's suspended up at the surface so the wacky one really comes into play because it stays in their face and you can let it fall for a little while and shake it up and let it fall and kind of keep it up high in the water column where it stays in the face of those fish that suspend under those docks later in the day. So you don't let it sink all the way to the bottom? Not, a lot of times I don't. It, you know, especially once I've gotten a bite up high in the water column, I will at first, like when I'm just, just getting there, trying to figure out, trying to get my first clue, my first bite, I'll fish it top to bottom whenever I'm first doing it. Nine times out of 10, your bite's gonna come higher in the water column. It'll be one of them deals, you'll pitch it in there, it'll be falling, and your line will just start running before it ever gets to the bottom. 
right? So you got to watch your slack when you weren't when you wake weren't falling. You really got to watch your slack. So one thing I want to do with you guys, I wanted to rate these docks. So what we got is we got a dock where the creek swings dang near under it. Then we got a couple docks on either side of that. We got one where the creek swings way far away from it. We got one where the creek comes close but doesn't quite go under it on this drawing right here. So if we had to rate these docks one to five, which one you want to fish? What's the best one on this stretch? Second one from the this one right here with the creek coming under it. Absolutely, that's number one. All right, which one are y'all going to say is number two? One to the left. One to the right. This one right here? Yeah. No, I think it's the one all the way to the end. That's the one I would call number two right there because the creek comes closest again, right? There we go. Now, which one's number three? Honestly, this could be 3A and 3B, right? Because right. you're still likely to have a few fish that have made home under that, especially if that's got more brush than this does. Or, or, or you know, if one of these has more brush than the other, it's going to be number three. And then the other one's going to be number four, right? So we'll do three and four right there. So what number does that make this dock right here? No, that makes this dock this one right here. Do not waste your time. That's the one. Hey, that's what this deal is all about is learning which docks to do I take time fishing, which docks do I not. Now there may be 10 docks in a row that are, don't fish it until that creek bend comes back in near it. But hey, a dock or two on either side of a creek bend that comes, comes in tight, the one that's right on where the creek bend comes in tight, sometimes the creek will come in, sometimes that creek will come in and stay right here. Now I'm gonna fish all of those. I'm gonna fish every one of them. And this is one A, one B, one C, and then these are two and three, right? So just depending on where that creek been and how close it goes, but never get more than a couple docks away from that creek being close. Wherever that creek starts widening back out and gets away from the bank, away from those docks, once it does that, leave those docks alone and move on. I don't care how much brush they have. I don't care how baited they look. I don't care, it doesn't matter. Because what matters right now is the movement of the fish during this season, they're transitioning. So they're going to gather on the docks that are closest to their highway, okay? All right, that's dock fishing during the transition. Any questions on that before I move on? So whenever, even whenever it gets later in the day, still go to either side, say, of that number one dog, yeah. still go to either side, even in the heat of the day? Yes, yes, because fish are really dumb and they do dumb things for dumb reasons. Even the docks that I'm telling you not to fish, doesn't mean you can't go over and catch fish. Right, right. right. But okay. Just a high percentage area. The percentage of the there's gonna be more bass on the ones on the creek swing. There might be some on the ones next to it. Once I get away from that, I don't want to mess with it. Cause yeah, there might be one there, but the odd that's when you start getting overwhelmed with there's five thousand docks on this lake. Where do I fish? Well, we're trying to eliminate. I mean, cause the reality is those creek swing docks are gonna be one in ten, <laughs> one in twenty of all the docks that you'll see on a map. So we're really eliminating ninety to ninety-five percent of the docks on this lake which is what you want to do when you're trying to decide which docks do I fish. But you're saying that uh, these fish aren't going to just be moving in and out of there, but pretty much be hanging out in those yeah. areas. So what I'm saying is, if you go there and catch a little fish, you really don't even need to sit there all day hoping there's going to be more move in that same area? Or? Well, no, so they are moving. They're all moving this time of year. They are all moving. And they move more in the fall than they do even in the spring. So even as we go through on, on throughout fall, man, they roam chasing bait all over the place. That's, it really changes from moving for comfort and temperature needs to they start moving because the bait's moving in the fall. But right now they're moving because of turnover and it's just that time to transition. Uh, so they are all moving. All these are is docks that are adjacent to um, stop signs from the contours on the bottom. So yeah, they're going to stop there for a little while, but that doesn't, new ones are always coming to that stop sign every day. And then some of those fish that have been there are leaving every day. So they're all moving. These are just the areas that are going to gather fish. So yeah, if you catch two or three fish on that dock at noon and then you move on down the stretch and now it's three o'clock, we got 30 more minutes, go hit it again. Cause there might be some new ones that pulled in there. One or two, you know? Last year, yes, sir. At, at night, I would say they're probably moving more, right? Mm. Or you think they're still moving about the same? I, I, think, I think it's probably pretty similar. Okay. I think. It's, I mean, I, I don't really know. I've never really read a study on that. Um, I don't have a tremendous amount of night fishing experience to, to rely on. Um, but I, I don't see why it'd be any different, honestly. Okay. If anything, I would say with less visibility, they might move less at night. It, from my experience, because me and Vic, we fish a lot of nights. Um, 
they they do move less. Mm -hmm. um, but at your lighted docks, they, they they're moving as like as daytime. You the, can see them. I mean, and they're that's what I was gonna say. Is at night, everything changes because of there's. 150, 200 green lights on underwater lights on docks out here, and then everybody else has got a light shining in the water, and which ones are on tonight and off tomorrow. So the light situation gathers the bait fish and completely changes the dynamic of contours and structure. It just changes the whole game at night because of the lights around docks. While we're on the subject, you don't mind if I ask, I just installed black lights and LED strips on the outside of my boat. Mm -hmm. Really nice. Starting starts at six. You got a good 45 minutes to you can see it gets a little light and eating that fish. Okay, well, you can see that's definitely going to bring some shad up. But is that a problem? I, I you had your fish away from the area or get too close to you? No, I don't think so. I think anything you can do to attract bait to where you are is a good thing. If anything else, you, you carry, you know, if bait fish are attracted to the lighting on your boat. Yeah. And I mean, for years when we night fish, what we do, we took lights, underwater lights, and on a rope and threw them off the side of our boat. So if you've got those mounted in your rub rails or whatever it is, and that's causing bait fish to gather around your boat, all that's gonna do is make the fish that do get close to you more prone to feed and get active. I don't, that's nothing but a positive to me. What I, I just kind of curious about that, uh, in this last term, I'm sitting out there, black lights are on. I knew it was on fish the day before. And, uh, had all these bait fish around me and everything, uh, but I, I wasn't there before daylight in this one area. I found it a little bit later, so I sat there all day. You know, it was like it's late. I didn't get the bite. Mm. My black lights have something to do with this, or what? No, I, I ran. I didn't run black lights. I ran the white LED strips down my side of my boat in my first two boats because uh -huh. I did. Me and Vic did a lot of night fishing. Um, for one, it does carry in, uh, you know, bait fish, bugs, bugs, bait fishing, bugs, blah, blah, blah. Um, another thing it helps with is you can see the bank to see where you're throwing better as well. There's nothing, it don't scare the fish off, in my opinion. I just kind of, I didn't think so, but it's like, that's something that's, you know, gets in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. You can foul your game up. You know? Yeah, absolutely. No, we want to answer every question we can. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I didn't really speak on that, but yeah, if you have that technology like I have, I've got a Hummingbird 360. And now, 360 is not going to tell me nothing about. I'm not going. There's well, 360. I don't know. I guess if you were zoomed way in and you were close to the dock, you might be able to mark some fish. But I run it at about 80 feet most of the time on my 360 on my. My circumference from center. Um, with dock pilings all grouped up, you're not going to mark fish in there. At least I'm not. I'm not seeing fish on docks on a 360, but on active target, I absolutely am. Yeah. 60, you're probably marking like brush and stuff over center. And I'll tell you what else you'll mark. You'll mark a stump, a lay down, or something that's right outside the dock that you didn't know existed. It's under the water. Man, we might make a little pitch over there at that. You know what I mean? Like we do do that with the 360 around docks. Hey, look at that, look at that brush pile over there. Look at that lay down over there. And then we'll pitch that shaky head at Wacky Worm to that. And that just a lot of times give us what I call bonus fish, which bonus fish are great. You know, I, bonus fish is something we always have referred to in the guide business for a long time. Be like, well, we're going to fish that grass in the back, but on the way in, we're going to fish this bank line. We're going to fish that shore grass leading back to it. If we catch one, it's a bonus fish. Same deal with these docks with 360. If I see a lay down a brush pile and we pitch a shaky head over and catch one, that's just an added fish that we weren't even going to target. And that's one thing that the 360 and active target, all this new technology, it, it adds bonus fish every day almost. I mean, it really does if you're using them throughout the day. The live scope, the active target, phenomenal tool for docks. Now I will tell you, it's gonna take you a little bit of time. You're gonna get frustrated when you first look under a dock with one of those live sonars. You're gonna go, how can I see anything in all that jumbled mess? But what you do is you learn to be still enough, long enough, and get the right angles on the dock pilings, and then you can kind of see in between them, right? And you will, if there's bass in there, you'll see them moving in between those pilings, and you can mark, well, there's some bait, there's some little fish. Oh, there's, there's the one I want right there. And uh, in fact, if, if, I know a lot of you guys, if you're here, you probably follow some of the stuff we do on social media. And if you saw, we posted a picture of a fish, real big fish, didn't wait as much as it should, but we had one this week that was a giant. I mean, a giant, had big old head, just didn't have a lot of weight on her. And I made a post said, man, I hope she comes to see me in February. Well, that fish right there, we pulled up to this dock. It's dock I've been fishing every afternoon towards the end of the trip because 
the bait and everything gets active in there late in the day and there's fish always sitting on that dock waiting to ambush bait in that <coughs> you know two three o'clock range one o'clock range so I, I scanned over there with active target I saw that fish sitting between the first and second piling on the front left corner of that dock that fish was sitting right there I told that guy with that shaggy and I said she's right there and he threw over there and he didn't even know she bit she was just old and lazy lethargic you know just poor fish from summer and all that didn't have a lot of energy to her so she didn't really bite real hard but he was like started reeling his bait and he's like where's my line going this is my lines all the way out here next thing i know the guy's like oh i got a fish and it's right by the boat running hot but yeah he threw on that dock right between the two piles i told him to and caught that fish and i saw her on active target so and yes if i pull up to a dock and i scan under there and i don't see a bass I'm going to make two or three pitches on that dock because sometimes, let me tell you a little something about active target. It don't show you every fish. Like you don't see every fish on there. There might be five of them under there that you don't see because they're so tight to a, a piece of cover, a brush, a dock pile or something, whatever, right? Or they're so high suspended by the, you just don't see them. So I'll, while having my active target on there, I'll skip a jig, skip shake your head, what I'll get something under there. Now, if you get something under there and nothing moves on it, I'll, like I said, I'll make two, three, four casts under that dog. If I don't see nothing by then, I'm bouncing. Because here's the deal. If I pitch a bait under there and nothing moves around that bait or comes and looks at it or does or reacts in some kind of way, one of two possibilities. One, there ain't none there. Two, the ones that are there ain't going to bite. So we might as well go either way, right? That's another thing you learn about active target. It's a lot like bed fishing. When you pitch that bait in there, that fish won't do nothing at all, won't react, won't do nothing. Or if that fish just kind of leaves and doesn't come back, there's no sense in fishing for that bed fish, right? Same thing with this active target. If you throw a bait at it and it goes the other way, like it goes away from your bait, don't waste your time. Maybe make two casts to it. If it doesn't turn around and respond positively to your bait, leave. Leave that one alone, move on to the next one. She's not gonna bite. So yes, active target plays a very good role. Now, if you don't have that, you can still eliminate 95% 90, of the docks on what we talked about and go hit those high percentage docks, right? You just have to fish all of them thoroughly. That's what these electronics do. They make you so much more efficient. You don't make a cast. You don't make any wasted casts. You don't sit there and spend 30 minutes picking a dock apart and there's nothing there or nothing there that wants a bite, right? Because now with Active Target, you can see, okay, we got some fish around this dock that are responding to baits. They're moving towards our baits. We're going to pick this dock apart and fish it for an hour if we need to, you know? So you just stay a lot more efficient. Now, whenever you're fishing the docks, I assume what I've been doing I've been newly fishing dogs or whatever. I'm kind of new to it, but I've been trying to. I try to stay off the dog as far as I can. Yep. So the trolling motor noise. It's different to... with guiding. Back in the day, the old school dog mentality. And I grew up on Lake Conroe fishing a lot of dogs. I always made my first cast to the outside post and stay as far away from it as I can. Now, uh, uh, forget that. I want to go look under that dock because I can look under it now yeah, with the active target. The, the trolling motor noise and all that. I think it does at times, but honestly, the fish that are running away from your trolling motor probably aren't going to bite. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. And that's how, so my old adage of how to fish docks was fish them from the outside in and start off as far away as I can, cast to that outside post first, and then slowly move in closer and closer to make the more accurate cast under there and all that and around the backside. But now with Active Target, I just go in where I'm 34, to maybe 30 feet away from the outside piling, and I can look under there and know what I'm casting at and know if there's fish there and all that. And I want to be close enough to where if I skip my bait under there, I can see it falling back under the dock. I want to be able to see everything now because I can. That's new to this year. Like we haven't been able to do that in the past. So I've kind of, I've noticed that I have foregone the stay away, hit the outside post first theory that I used to have, because now I can just go up there and I can know what I'm casting at. Right. I understand. And that's the way I always did it. Cause man, so many times you pick one up off that outside post that you might not have, if you got too close, that was my, my theory on that. Now I can go look at them. So it's different, right? All right, any other questions on the docks before we move on to the grass? <clears throat> if you don't have that technology, is it probably better if you are fishing a tournament just to pick out, you know, say you picked out docks on Avionics or what have you, and 
just hit specific this, hit this one, we're going to hit this one, we're going to hit that one. Yeah, yeah. Pick out those two or three or four docks around that creek swing, boom, to the next one. Exactly. Don't go fishing every dock. Dude, I'm, listen, that's like saying, hey, man, let's go to Lake Fork and let's fish every tree in Little Canyon. <laughs> no, let's fish the trees on the points, let's fish the trees on the creek bends. Let's fish the trees on the humps. Let's not go fish all 500,000 stumps in Little Canyon. It's not, you're not gonna do it. And you're gonna spend a lot of time fishing dead water. Anytime, you, and I've said this many times over the years on camera, anytime you're fishing any type of situation where you have an overwhelming amount of cover, whether you have an overwhelming amount of docks, timber, grass, whatever it is, anytime, the bottom contours matter. What you need to do is pretend no docks are on that bank line. What part of that bank line would you fish if there was no docks there? Well, you'd fish that creek channel swing. Well, let's fish that dock and the two next to it. Then let's move on to the next creek swing. So whenever you have overabundance of cover, pretend it doesn't exist, look at the bottom contours, pick where you'd fish in that area, only fish the cover in those areas. Do you think bottom content plays a part too? Like is that harder bottom? Or Absolutely does. Always with bass. Yeah. It, there's never a time where bottom content doesn't, you know, a harder bottom is always better. Right, always. So, the only time that that can be trumped and and not matter as much is what we're about to talk about. And that's grass, because when you got grass, the bottom content can still matter, but it doesn't have to. It's really about the healthiest grass. It becomes about the healthiest grass. That's what it becomes about. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, what we're going to talk about is grass fishing. Now, there's not just a tremendous amount of huge grass flats on the lake with a ton of healthy grass, but there is some. There is some, and there's several around the lake if you if you go find them. One way you can find them, Fish Life app. We've got them marked on there right now. We've got several grass flats marked. We've got several of those key stretches of docks marked. You can go to Fish Life uh, at App Store. Uh, Google Play Store or www.fishlife.net. The important thing is the life is spelled with a Y, L Y F E. Uh, yeah, you hire a guide too. You can get and you can get several of them booked over at yourlakeforguide.com too. While we're at it, go to sixcentsfishing.com, <laughs> order some baits and punch in that code your lake fort guide. You'll get a ten percent discount on all orders. All right, we got all the plugs out of the way. No, you forgot one. What I do? I gotta say it because I finally I got my pair in today. Waterland. Waterland. That's what we got. Waterland. Hey, you need glasses? Go to waterlandco.com or Six Cents Fishing. Get me the place. At Waterland Co. Though, if you go use your Lake Fort guy there, you get a fifteen percent discount. Even better. How about that? So, all right. What we'll find in grass flats, in some, in a lot of ways, is similar to what we talked about with the docks. What's happening right now? They're transitioning. They're moving a lot. What's their highways? Creek channels, drains, low spots. That's how they move. So what do you think we're going to focus on in a grass flat? Creek channels, drains, yeah. And the best parts of a creek channel to gather fish are creek channel swings and junctions. That's the two things that are really going to come into hand and, and play and be a really big gathering area when fish don't want to gather, right? When they're, when they're all spread out, those swings and junctions are going to be the two places that those fish will gather in and amongst that creek channel. That's their stop signs they, where they can set up a temporary home and go from 10 foot of water to two foot of water, back to 10 foot of water, all within a minute of each other, right? They can go up there, grab my shed, and run right back down that creek anytime they want to. So what I do when I'm fishing creek channels is I look for areas that have a lot of swings. If, I, if I've got an area, okay, I know this huge section of this creek has grass all around the creek channel, right? Has, and we're talking hydrilla coontail on Lake Fork is what we're talking. So if I got this big section, it's bigger than this board, right? What I want to do is look for the section that has the most creek channel swings and the most junctions. If I, let's just say we had a drain coming off here, right? So we've got a little secondary low spot, a secondary drain that feeds into the creek right here. All right, there's our drain. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put this time of year because what's going to happen is they're going to be in the creek channel at times. They're not going to be as prone to feed in the creek channel. What they're going to do when they want to feed is jump up on this flat and feed. So what I like to do this time of year is put my boat in the creek channel. And I just follow the creek channel with my boat and I fan cast all this grass. But I want to be in an area that's as high percentage as possible. So I want to get an area that has the most swings, the most junctions. Here's what happens when you have creek channel swings. 
Eliminate everything on here except for this line right here. What does that line look like right there? A point. Oh, yeah. Just this inside line right here. Y'all see that? Everybody see that? That creates a point. So everywhere you have a creek channel swing, you have a main lake point that's out. It's an offshore point. It might only be two foot of water deep. It might be five foot of water deep. That is a offshore point. It's out in the middle. The bank's way over here. The bank's way over here. This is the creek channel. This is the middle. That's an offshore point. This one right here, that's another offshore point. Well, you know what fish love to pull up on, to pin shad on? Because of the depth changes and the, the shape and the contour of them, they come to that point. Fish love to push bait up on points and feed and pin them up there and feed, right? So they, this is where these fish are going to feed in this creek the most, in the most numbers. So when you get to these areas, you really slow down around those creek channel swings. And they might be out here on the outside of the swing, out here on this part of the flat. But I'm telling you right now, these creek channels where I'm catching the schools of fish, where I'm seeing them pop up and visibly chase shad and school on the surface, every single time, it's on a point. It's on... These, yeah, these areas are covered in grass. Like this, this area right here is grass all the way around on either side of the creek channel, right? And there's several of those scenarios out here right now. Um, but yeah, this is grass, specifically grass related fish. This is about going into an area, there's a hundred acres of hydrilla. Where is the spot that I need to spend my time? Where's the one spot that I really need to beat it to death, focus on and spend the most of my time fishing? That's what this is about. So if you're fishing the, you know, like the mainland, swing, or like using the mainland, yeah, swing the, the creek swing point, right? Would it? I'm just thinking, would it not be smarter to go on the outside, on that other side of that grass, and make a longer cast so your bait is in the strike zone longer, or no? Well, it could be. I mean, yeah, if you want to break it down and be that definite with it, but what we do is we just put our boat in here, and then as we come through here, now we can fan cast to here, we can fan cast to here, we can hit here. Like, we just fan cast the whole thing. Yeah. Because, yeah, these, this is where these fish are popping up and schooling, but that doesn't mean we're not catching some over here. And that also, I mean, again, it's a lot like the docks. I think he's got in mind a partner in the back. You know, both fishing off right. the side. Yeah. I think that's where he's coming well, hey, I'm a guy. I'm a guy. I have two guy. I have two partners. One right behind me, and one in the back all the time. But when you put your boat in the creek channel, as you come up here, what better way to let the whole boat access a point than to go all the way around it? Yeah. Now we can all hit that point from any side we want to, right? So don't get too caught up. Also, remember these fish when they're up there feeding on the hot spots, they are moving. They are roaming around. They're chasing shad, pinning them up. So they might pop up anywhere. So yeah, you don't, have, don't get too concerned about, well, I need to make this long cast. Dude, you're gonna have an opportunity to make a long cast to it as you go all the way around it. Okay. And those fish, when they get up there, are chasing that bait around. Okay. You probably think about cutting your partner off, right? You're well, fishing on very tight. You, no, I think what he was saying is, why wouldn't I put the boat over here so I'm making a longer cast to the tip right. of the point? That's, that's yeah. what I was getting right. at. But what, you, what, what you, but what you gotta think about is as you come up here, when your boat's right here, you just made a long cast to the end of the point. Gotcha. And if you're worried about cutting, getting too close to this part of the point, well, when you're down here, you just make a long cast of there. Okay. Yeah, so you're fan casting the whole time as you approach each and every corner and curve of that creek channel. Gotcha. That's the deal. You just put your boat in creek channel and you fan cast all around, all out in front, everywhere, right? Up on the flats, outside of the creek channels, and you fish the bait back to you in the creek channel. Gotcha. Um, and you cover the whole thing that way. Don't overthink it. Yeah. I think you might I be do. trying to overthink I, it a little I bit. Overthink it a little you bit. overthink it? Yeah, I do. You can do that in this game, and you don't need to, yeah. right? Because I had that situation almost look identical to that, but there wasn't quite as much grass as what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But I was trying to, I was kind of trying to, I noticed that they were sitting outside of the creek channel, so I was trying to kind of stay off of it a bit, so I was making longer casts trying to, yeah. I guess. And in that situation, if you're seeing something to dictate that, then, yeah, that might be the right play. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir? Times on this lake, I've noticed that avionics mapping will show a creek channel. Mm -hmm. But then when I get up there, actually, yeah. maybe it's off or maybe it's yeah. no real depth difference. Yeah, it's, some, it's so, silted in some of them are silted in. There are some creeks that have better channels than others. Mm -hmm. uh, and the ones that have better channels are usually the better ones to fish in. That matters. The ones that have sharper edges on the creek drop off, that, that helps. That's always a better deal. Uh, some of them are still tending. Some of those lines, those blue creek channel lines on your, on your Navionics map are just going to be off. That's going to happen. 
I know that for, and it doesn't matter what map chip you're using, Avionics, Lake Master, I don't care what it is. Some of those blue line channels are going to be off. Whatever color you're, I think on Lake Master, it's purple dots or something. I don't know. Whatever is marking your creek channel is not always going to be exact. So what you have to do when you lose the creek channel is you, because that's what happens. You follow the blue line, all of a sudden you're not in the creek channel. Well, now I got to move over to the right. Oh, I can't find it over there. Move over to the, you just got to start doing this until you find the depth change on your trolling motor. And sometimes it may not be there because it may be really silted in order. It'll always be there, but it might just be a more subtle rounded off change. When you start seeing that, odds are that creek channel is not going to be as productive as creek channels with sharp drop offs. But don't give up on it till you get to a bend because a bend, the outside bend is always where the sharpest drop off will be. Before this was a lake, when water ran down this creek, it ran up against that outside bend harder, so it created that, you know, like when you see a creek in the woods and all the old tree roots are exposed, it's got that bluff wall on it. it. May only be three foot tall, but there's a bluff wall on it on the outside. Your sharpest drop will always be here. So just because it's silted in here doesn't mean it's not great right here. So make sure you're looking at a couple outside bends before you decide, well, this creek channel's just silted in, right? But if, it, if you find one and you're like, the whole thing's just silted in, even outside bends, you probably need to go to a different creek. I do on deeper ones. Um, I really don't on shallow ones. I mean, I've fished here so much now. I've been here for 12 years now. Um, and I've seen the lake at different levels and, you know, different grass growing and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so in the shallow ones, I don't really necessarily mark waypoints because in the shallow ones, typically I'm fan casting around the channel. Now, in the medium depth to deeper creek channels that we fish a jig in in the wintertime, where I really want to be precise and put my jig right on that sharpest part of the drop-off on the outside bend, I absolutely mark waypoints. I actually made a video this last winter about how I do that. And if you look in certain creeks, like you can tell the creeks I like to fish a jig in that have like the really good drop-offs, because you'll look at my map and there will be hundreds of waypoints in one creek arm. Because it's like boop, 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 boop. Like I've marked every, you know, the whole turn of the bend on every good outside bend. So yes, I do map those out on the medium to deep. You know, once I get the six, eight, 10 foot of water and deeper, I'll map those out for jig fishing in the wintertime. But that's because I have to put that jig right there. Like it's gotta be on the, the drop. I can't miss that in that type. I mean, we're sitting still dragging a jig as slow as we can drag it. I've gotta make sure every cast is in the right exact spot. And that my customers cast are too. This deal, Man, as long as I, honestly, look, if my boat ends up up here, I, it's okay. We'll get back over here. We're just going to keep fan casting around. This is not a, I have to hit this part of this bend. I can catch a fish anywhere around these. These are just stop signs that tend to make some of them gravitate towards it when fish aren't really wanting to gather. So we're wanting to stay in this general area, but it's not a, I have to cast on that bend. So I don't really waypoint those. All right. Um, so let, let's, talk, let's talk about this map like we did the docks, right? So we've got one big swing here, one big swing here, a little bit more dull swing, a little bit softer swing here. We've got a junction right here. So where do you guys think the best spot to fish in this section of the creek is? I'd say that main point. This one? This is this what you think is the best? So see what so we said junctions matter too, right? Yeah. Because now what do I got? I got another point, and I got another point. Yeah, they're not as sharp, but I've got a point and a point. I've got another. I've got another highway. Got the the inside on the creek there. Yeah. Where do the traffic jams happen on the highway? At the intersections and the exits, right? And that's what that is. So I've got this point. I've got this point. This point. I've got this funnel and this funnel. So that's got a lot of things going on. So we're going to call that number one. All right, now, and we've also got this little round point and this little round swing down here too, right? So where's number two? Where do we think the second best area to fish in here is? The main, the biggest point there. Probably right there. Yeah. That's right, I would agree with that. All that one right above it, two B or whatever. No, I would say because this is sharper. Okay. This is a sharper bend. It's probably going to be better. Um, so now we basically got very similar things here, right? Yeah. Is that right? Did I do that right? Mm -hmm. I didn't do any of them backwards? Is that based on current flow? Huh? Is that based on current flow? No, these, these could be 3A and 3B. They're, they're basically the same. 
Here, here's the X factor in grass. And what you notice I didn't do, there's no X's on this one, right? There's no X's on this one. Yeah, yeah. You can be, as long as there's grass there, especially healthy grass, hydro or coontail, you can fish all of this. I mean, you can fish way over here. You can fish way over here. They might, they might roam around. They're gonna. It's not like a dock where you've got that dock. They're gonna roam that grass flat more. We want to stay around the creek channel. That's gonna be our higher percentage area. But there's not gonna be any bend in a creek channel that has grass around it. That's a no go. They're all possible for those fish to pop up in and feed. The other thing that's gonna be a factor that you gotta learn how to decide is the health of the grass. Especially this time of year, when we're experiencing, and we've just been experiencing, and we still kind of are a little bit, turnover conditions. That means that oxygen has been depleted out of the water. The fish are dealing with the lowest oxygen content of the year. You know what puts oxygen in water? You know what puts more oxygen in water? Healthy grass. The healthiest grass is gonna produce the most oxygen. So, if there's healthy grass down here on four, like really, really healthy grass, and the grass up here on number one is dead and muddy and dying and not green, brown, this is gonna be a lot better than number one. The health of the grass can change everything on where the fish gather in a flat. These are bottom contours and structures that increase your percentage, but like we always say, there's no absolutes in fishing. There's not ever an absolute in fishing. There's things that we do to put the odds in our favor. And being around creek channel swings and junctions is gonna put the odds in your favor, but what also puts the odds in your favor is healthy grass. The healthier the grass is, the better. Now, in this particular scenario, there's healthy grass from top to bottom in there. It's, it's all the same. So now I just rely on my structures, right? My contours. Does that make sense? All right. Doing anything around lily pads? Uh, not in particular. I mean, yeah, if, like everything else we've talked about, if they correlate with what I want to see on the, with the bottom contours. Yeah, if I'm in an area that's got a, a creek channel drain or junction or something I want to fish and it's got some lily pads, heck yeah, we're going to fish them. So we're not talking about glade? No, we're not talking, no, this is not glade. But mm -hmm. glade is a great, hey, glade's one of the best creeks on Lake in the fall. Oh, right. Always has been, always will be. You want to talk about grass? Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The bad thing about it is you can never get in there. A lot of boats. A lot of boats typically in Glade. Yeah, you're right. Glade's a popular, popular creek. This is not Glade, but it could be, but it's not. I'll tell you, there's a section in Glade that actually looks just like this, uh, but that particular section, the grass has not grown well in this year. Uh, there's not very much grass, and I'm just not fishing it very much because of that, because I'd rather be around the areas that have grass. I think the fish are gathering around the grass in better numbers when you have it they're going to feel better they're going to feed better uh, it's just a healthier ecosystem when there's healthy grass in there we all know what grass does for bass i mean you you fill a lake up with hot drilling coontail man you'll have a world-class bass fishery in about a year maybe two tops right like world class you take grass out of a world-class bass fishery it's going to be mediocre at best in a few years if you take it completely out you have lake cooper Ex yeah. exactly, exactly. world-class bass fishery to man i hope we can catch some sand bass today <laughs> like that's, that's what it went to really i mean it really did so all right it's sure been a little different to y'all you know i'm starting i'm starting to get away from sand it's definitely been different um let's say harder to catch fish harder to harder to pattern them consistently we we've seemed to have had a lot of in between water temperatures where fish will start to go out deep because it's getting hot and it cools off and it spreads them back out or or fish will start to go shallow because it's warming up in the springtime and then it cools off or they're going shallow because it's cooling off and then it warms up like we're experiencing right now like okay if we would just get another cold front we could get some fall bite like real fall bite going not this little spurts of it but we just have gotten a lot of the, it starts to move them and then it just stalls. It seems like we spent a lot of time in transitional periods this year, which is why these things we're talking about are so important because we have got caught into long transition times this time of year. Well, from fish in like two foot of water in February before we had the hard freeze. Absolutely, we had a warm January. If you remember, we had fish spawning. We had a few fish spawning in January because the water temps got up to 59 degrees in areas and we had a full moon. We actually had a few fish spawn. And that's what I was about to say. Going from winter to spring this year, 
it never really got down into the 40s water temp wise then we had a freeze in the middle of february and it got into the 40s for like a day or two but then it was 80 degrees two days after the freeze broke and the water temp got right back up in the 50s and we basically had 50 degree pre-spawn water temps which is tr fish transitioning from winter to spring until april almost you know like we had it till april almost and then from there we ended up getting waters in the high 70s low 80s after the spawn and they stayed there most of the summer then we finally started getting hot in august cooled down at the end of august now we've stayed in the low 80s for another month and a half two months like it's just been a lot of just not the normal okay the water's climbing it keeps climbing now the water's falling it keeps falling that hasn't really happened this year the way it does happen in some years but i hesitate to call things different because it seems like every year we're talking about something else where we're like yeah. man this ain't how it usually is it's never like it usually is there is no usual you just take the conditions you're presented and you go figure out how to catch them is all you can do so um cody i know we've been rambling on for a long time about that we need to get to some baits and stuff you're talking about well, i was gonna bring up one thing next friday the day before the tournament mm -hmm. yeah. We it's finally got point. highs in the 70s. Yeah, highs is 71 on Saturday, 72 on Sunday, lows in the 40s. And that is going, with that not happening until the day of that tournament of Berkeley, what, what ought to happen, and I could be wrong, because I often am, most usually am, but what I would think would happen is you'll take these transitional fish and it'll just fire them up. They won't have enough time to start leaving yet, but you'll just take these type of areas that we're talking about and they'll just bite in those areas. And then they'll start moving and following the shad and gathering up in more groups. They'll start getting more and more gathered. But anytime you're in the fall period, stop signs are good. Transitional stop signs are really good because fish move in the fall. And if they're moving, your best chance of finding them is that, is that hey, what's your best chance to throw a, throw a lure at a car on the highway when there's a red light, right? <laughs> That's the best chance to hit a car with a bait. So that's what, that's what it is. What are we doing if we're going fishing next weekend, Cody, bait-wise? All right, so obviously y'all got a week to get baits together. You know, with me being Berkeley, you know, I don't fish with Berkeley a whole lot. You know, the, the Berkeley tournament was the only time I really used it. So you got to find something that you can use that you're kind of used to. Unfortunately, Berkeley does not make a frog, a popping frog. But Siebel does, which is owned by Berkeley.